I would like to open with a children's song. It is a song that brings back memories for me of growing up in Manila in the Philippines. Probably every child learns these rhymes and knows the words and rhythms by heart in both English and Tagalog, which is what you'll hear uh, by the time we reach uh, grade school. Uh, that's the case, at least for me in Manila. Okay, here it goes. Planting rice is never fun Then from morn till the set of sun Cannot stand and cannot sit Cannot rest for a little bit Planting rice is never fun Then from morn till the set of sun Cannot stand and cannot sit Cannot rest for a little bit Planting rice is no fun Then from morn till the set of sun Cannot stand and cannot sit Cannot rest for a little bit Planting rice is no fun Then from morn to the set of sun Cannot stand and cannot sit Cannot rest for a little bit Magkanib hindi biro Maghapong nakayo ko Di naman makakayo Di naman makahuko Magkanib hindi biro Maghapong nakayo ko Naman makatayo, di naman makahukong Planting rice is no fun Then from morn to the set of sun Cannot stand and cannot sit Cannot rest for a little bit Planting rice is no fun Then from morn to the set of sun Cannot stand and cannot sit Cannot rest for a little bit Like any children's song, the tune, as you just heard, is catchy. It's upbeat. But the words themselves are about the toil of farmers out in wet rice paddies, specifically the backbreaking and repetitive labor of planting rice from morn till the set of sun, as the song goes. I wanted to open by sharing this song with you about the act of planting rice to offer a perspective on soil that sees soil as practice as a relentless and dynamic interweaving of many movements from which emerge cultivators and cultivated. Soil is constitutive of and inseparable from life and death. And I want to honor that inseparability by learning how to see soil as practice. Much of my research in recent years has been on the cultivation of rice. And once I started to take the materialities of farming or of planting uh, seriously, it became quite clear that soil is very much a verb. Soil is a verb that entangles body and land, figure and ground. Soil is hardly a passive backdrop for human actions. Rather, soil is a verb that mobilizes and immobilizes to make relations that may be livable. Seeing soil as verb starts to point to the heart of our puzzle, I think. The work does not end when we say that we want livable relations. That is just where the hard work begins. The real puzzle is this. How do we seek out? How might we define collectively which relations may be livable and for whom? In a recent talk, philosopher Ashil Mbembe noted that the key question that colonization raises is who owns the earth? For whom and to whom does the earth belong? The key project of decolonization for Mbembe is to respond to that question with a resounding cry that the earth belongs to all of us. The earth is what we all hold and possess in common. We all define how the earth becomes livable. This is a powerful way of articulating decolonization, and I want to build on it by turning the statement by insisting that we, we in our various configurations and compositions, belong to the earth. It is practices of belonging that define livability. So we are of this earth, perhaps one of its many lively qualities, rather than one of its managers or owners. We, simultaneously and differentially, 
are possessed by, cultivated and composed by, the various, the multiple, the understoried, more than human workings of the earth. Soil or earth are not just metaphors, but are materialities that articulate practices of belonging. In my presentation, I'll try to unpack what I mean by soil as verb and earth as relation by talking through five scenes. Scene one, placing seeds or seedlings in soil, seeding rice fields so that the cultivar might grow and perhaps flower and flourish is an act of imagining and making a claim for an ongoing or future relation. Practices of planting imagine better days to come because they have done so in the past. But what counts as a better future? For purveyors of industrialized agriculture, better means more yield, higher grain productivity. For farmers otherwise, better might mean a capacity to live together, to sustain lasting relations with kin and land. So there is a vast spectrum of what might count as a better future. And so there are hundreds of thousands of rice cultivars, ranging from indigenous varieties and foraged wild grains to colonial breeds, state certified seeds, and genetically modified hybrids. Each cultivar or variety of rice embodies many histories, many past cycles of coordination, experimentation, and adaptation in order to survive in different futures. Each cultivar depends on or demands its particular ensemble of relations. Now the practices of planting and the ensembles are quite different. For example, in much of Asia and Africa, planting rice is done by hand. Farmers' bodies bend downward, knee deep in water, feet in mud, hands move back and forth, picking seeds and laying them, lay, laying them down uh, swiftly, one at a time, in flooded fields. In Northern California, planting runs are done from the air. Single-engine, GPS-guided airplanes swoop noisily across fields, dropping bleach-soaked seeds from 30 feet or 9 meters above the ground, covering thousands of hectares in a matter of days. In Australia, tractors and machines direct drill the seeds into dry ground to a depth of one inch or 30 millimeters, apparently the precise and ideal depth for seeds to be able to germinate and establish themselves. In Japan, robotic seeders plant seedlings while simultaneously discharging fertilizers and insecticides, a kind of all-in-one uh, cyborg uh, operation. So my point is that there's a vast spectrum of cultivars and the kinds of cultivators they require. Some human, some machine, some molecular, some microbial, some multinational. They come together, they depend not exclusively on, but a very great deal on, the specific materiality of soil. What then is soil? There's no singular definition. Natural scientists see soil as a complex and variable mix of mineral and organic matter, water, air, decaying and living organisms, bacteria, fungi, chemical compounds. Uh, social scientists see more than human cultures. Maria Puig de la Bella Casa, for example, uh, articulates soil as a living multi-species world. Soil is not only Puy de la Belacasa writes, uh, soil is not only a receptacle for producing crops that serve human needs at mass scale. With Filippo Bertoni, we get to see soil through the churning and wriggling bodies of lively earthworms. With Christina Lyons, we get to see the stewardship of soil at the intersections of decomposing leaves, peasant farms, forests, and state-run institutions in Colombia. Soil is a complex natural and cultural mix, the rich, deep brown, earthy smelling stuff of material semiotic practices, of modes of being that sediment and metabolize multiple pasts, presents, and futures. Scene two. 
I think of the vast spectrum of planting practices involving cultivars and cultivators as responses to the making and remaking of soil. Soil is a recursive relation, always making while being remade. In other words, soil configures and composes its subjects and objects, cultivators and cultivars, while at the same time being configured and composed by them, by us, by the all possessed by earth. The best kind of soil for growing rice is called alluvium, which is a loose mix of clay, silt, sand, and bits of gravel. It's a mix that gradually sediments from the movement of water, either from rainfall or river flows. And it's a mix that has to be able to alternate between holding water and uh, draining out. Archaeologist Bruce Smith takes us 9,000 years back to the Yangtze River in South China and its highly fertile alluvial floodplains, the probable scene of the earliest practice of practices of rice farming which he describes as a mimicry of the habits of wild rice. Uh, the habits of wild rice that were responses to soil that was seasonally flooded, or soil that was always in process. Smith writes, and I, I quote, The wild ancestor of domesticated rice was a plant of seasonally flooded areas, flourishing in the border zone between permanently dry and permanently flooded lands. The first efforts to cultivate rice could have begun with nothing more than deliberate attempts to extend the seasonally inundated habitat by constructing encircling dams that would trap and contain rainy season runoff, flooding out the existing dryland vegetation. By breaking these dikes at the end of the rainy season, the early cultivators could ensure that rice seed would have the drying soil it needed to germinate. These cultivators could have accelerated the expansion of wild rice by casting seeds they had harvested from wild stands in their newly created paddies at the end of the rainy season. The key subsequent step toward domestication, that is, the, the deliberate annual sowing and harvesting of paddies, would have closely mimicked the seasonal germination and growth cycles of wild rice. End quote. So I think of these early practices of mimicry as an art and science of recursive attunement, of listening closely and then responding, continuously coordinating with the rhythms and cycles of soil, water, sunlight, and seed. Eventually, the early cultivators began selecting and gathering the seeds of varieties that they wanted to see uh, again and sow again, uh, perhaps because the plants were bountiful or beautiful or simply delightful in their differences. To entice these desired varieties to grow and to return uh, from one season to the next, paddy soils needed care and elaboration. Scene 3. Cultivators enlist a slew of multi-species allies to keep uh, paddy soils fertile. They rotate crops with legumes such as peas and lentils. They collect leaf litter from forests and compost uh, organic waste. They burn rice straw and gather manure. They leave fields fallow for wild vegetation and microbiota to uh, recover. They work with water buffaloes, uh, ducks, birds, insects, and other animals. Uh, nitrogen is key to soil fertility, and these uh, multi-species alliances uh, must constantly be maintained in order to keep uh, nitrogen and other nutrients like phosphorus and uh, potassium in the soil. In the 19th century, uh, these local nutrient cycles and multi-species alliances were blasted open when two of the richest sources of organic nitrogen entered trans-oceanic trade. In the early 1800s, guano or bird poop uh, were harvested from the Chincha Islands off the coast of Peru. And then in the late 1800s, uh, sodium nitrates were mined from the Atacama Desert in Chile. 
Uh, historians Gregory Cushman and Edward Melillo write about the establishment of high-input capital-intensive agriculture in the 19th century and the reconfiguration of modern geopolitics with exports of Peruvian guano and Chilean nitrates uh, to distant lands. Farmers in the United States, France, and Great Britain gained dramatic increases in agricultural productivity. By the 1870s, shipments of organic nitrogen were fertilizing the soils of colonial plantations in the Caribbean, Asia, Central and South America, and Australia. The 20th century brought massive disruptions to the planet's nitrogen cycle. With the synthesis of ammonia, a simple nitrogen compound uh, by German-Jewish chemist uh, Fritz Haber, came the unprecedented ability to produce millions of tons of fertilizers for farms and explosives for war. Nitrogen compounds could be mass-produced out of the air in labs and factories in Germany and later in the United States. Out of the air rather than from the land and all the messy human and more than human alliances that belong to the land. Scene 4. July 16, 1945 is the date of the first nuclear detonation, codenamed Trinity, in New Mexico as part of the Manhattan Project. Science study scholar Joseph Masco marks this date as the beginning of what he calls the Age of Fallout, an age structured by and embedded within the unintended toxic effects of industrial modernity, a radioactive ecological regime that operates at a plurality of scales and temporalities that we can only ever know or, in, or engage with uh, partially. There were 215 detonations carried out in the U.S. between 1945 and 1962. Masco writes uh, that we are living in the unintended environmental aftermath of cumulative industrial projects a process that remakes bodies and atmospheres on a planetary scale and does so in ways that we have yet to fully account for, let alone begin to govern. A critical point that Masco makes in naming the age of fallout is that while these detonations radically transformed the constitution of the entire planet, they simultaneously gave rise to earth system science, or the scientific tools we now use to assess and get a better sense of planetary phenomena. That we have a conception of the earth as planetary system is just one of many effects of fallout. Masco notes that nuclear fallout was used to study global wind patterns and other atmospheric circulations. In the 1950s, for example, researchers were able to track the global distribution of strontium-90 through the food chain, demonstrating that the radioactive elements deposited in soil don't stay put, and they don't just disappear. Rather, radioactivity eventually makes its way into the bodies of plants and animals, and eventually into the bodies of humans around the world. And yet fallout does not affect everyone everywhere equally. Fallout, Masco writes, is collectively and asymmetrically distributed, marking everyone to a degree while having a more immediately damaging effect uh, and perhaps a more lasting effect as well on specific communities, ecologies, and bodies. Scene 5. In this last scene, I want to loop back to the paintings that accompanied the song that we heard earlier. These were painted in the 1940s, 1950s uh, by a Filipino painter named Fernando Amorsolo. The paintings depict idyllic landscapes with peasant farmers as the main subjects. Recalling the backdrop of Masco's Age of Fallout, the blue skies and quiet sunlit figures take on a more sinister quality. 
Amor Solo was born in Paco, a district of Manila, in 1892, in the final years of Spain's long colonization of the Philippine Islands, an occupation that lasted for almost 400 years. In 1898, Spain ceded the Philippines, along with Puerto Rico, Guam, and Cuba, to the United States. And the Philippines fought for its independence until 1946. So Amor Sola's life spanned a century of violent occupations that remained largely absent from his thousands of works. Supported by one of the wealthiest settler colonial families, the Zobel de Ayalas, Amor Sola spent time painting in Spain and New York and was influenced by painters like Velázquez and Sargent, as well as impressionists like Monet and Renoir. Amor Solo's paintings were and are in high demand among Filipino elites, and he was named National Artist of the Philippines shortly after his death in 1972. And that coincides with the rise of the Marcos regime and the Green Revolution, or the chemical intensive agriculture that was uh, sweeping through Southeast Asia by the 1970s. Not being a historian, I'd always seen Amor Solo's paintings ungenerously as reflections of what Filipinos call a colonial mentality, which is an internalized belief in inferiority uh, on the part of the formerly colonized, coupled with a belief in the superiority of the colonizers. So the paintings hardly represent the realities or the toil of peasant farmers. The figures, to me, uh, more closely resembled Europeans uh, dressed in native costume, not breaking a sweat as they posed to have their portraits painted. The lush green landscapes belie the violent geopolitics that played out and saturated Philippine soils for centuries. The erasure of those histories, so consistent in Amor Solo's work, seemed to me the ultimate form of epistemic violence. But as I put these paintings together on a single picture plane for this event, I noticed something peculiar. Each painting you see here has a row of farmers bending down, faceless, planting or harvesting rice. But breaking each row is a central female figure who stands up seemingly in a momentary refusal to bend down. In these scenes of sowing seeds and harvesting grains, the female figure looks up, not out at us, the viewers, but perhaps unconsciously at her surrounding lands. It does not strike me as a grand heroic gesture of resistance against colonization or against modernity or industrial capitalism, I see it as a humble act of catching one's breath, of disrupting the repetitive action demanded by the larger sociopolitical and ecological rhythms to which one belongs, one small moment that may be fleeting, but is, for the time being, one's own. These paintings, as I assembled them together on my computer screen a few weeks ago, made me stop. They made me wonder about the making and remaking of soil and the sedimentation and erasure of multiple more than human histories to which I belong. Centuries of planting rice in paddy soils bear witness to scenes and practices of belonging through mimicry, domestication, colonization, dispossession, and nuclear fallout. Those are the four scenes that I've tried to represent here. So this last scene is about the moments of breath that I or we rarely see, the breaks that we rarely take or recognize, perhaps because they seem inconsequential. These moments seem singular and fleeting at first, but are collective and perhaps enduring when seen across several frames. So I end here with images that gave me pause in the middle of colonized and radioactive rice paddies, learning how to see figures that belong to the earth through practices of planting from morning till the setting sun, and the figures that refuse to bend down, 
for one brief moment, and tangled through soil over centuries. Thank you for listening.